Thank you, George. So George's uh, speech, he really led me to reconsider whether our volunteer work is doing any good. Anyway, our next speaker is Professor Shao from the Central University of Finance and Economics. His research interest includes local government finance, property taxation, and social security. The speech shall lead us into its world exploring causality. Let's warmly welcome Professor Shao. Uh, esteemed guests, dear students and teachers at this uh, beautiful campus, um, good afternoon. My name is Lei Shao. I'm from the Central University of Finance and Economics. And in fact, my wife graduated from here 20 years ago. So, but it's my first time to be here. Uh, it's honored to be speaking at this uh, very special event. And the topic I want to share with you today is relation versus causality, unraveling the relationship. What do we mean by relation and causality? Well, you know, when we say A correlates with B, we mean that A and B often occur together. And if we say A causes B, it means a is the reason for the occurrence of B. It seems not difficult to differentiate between these two concepts, but, but it's crucial to really understand the difference in practice. So let me give you a few examples. Uh, how mistaking relation for causality can lead to very wrong conclusions? Well, this is the first one. I like it because it's amusing. Well, if you see the number of films Nicolas Cage appeared in, and the number of people who drowned by falling into a swimming pool, you see the two curves coincide. But I believe no one here will say that Nicolas Cage is the reason for people drowning. It's not a cause. It's just purely coincidental. It doesn't suggest any causal link. But things are not always so straightforward. Sometimes it can be quite deceitful. So let's move on to the next one. Hey, this is a research published on a top journal, New England Journal of Medicine. It, it demonstrates an intriguing correlation between two variables. On the x-axis, is the chocolate consumption per capita in the country, and on the y-axis, it's the number of Nobel Prize winners per 10 million people. Well, we see a very clear upward trend, so it means that those two variables are highly correlated. But does this suggest that in order for China to get more Nobel Prizes, we just have to eat more chocolates? Of course not. So, what could be the possible reason? Well, it's highly plausible some other factors, such as the country's average income level, average educational attainment, their culture, which contribute both to an increased consumption of chocolates and top quality research, scientific research. We call it the admitted variable. So it's not because A causes B or B causes A, but some other factor that causes the occurrence of A and B together, which gives us this correlation, but not a causality. Well, you may see it is still not so deceitful. Okay? How about this? It's between smoking and depression. Well, if you see on the diagram, uh, you will see, you will find that among those who have depression, there's a higher percentage of smokers. But does it necessarily imply that smoking causes depression? Well, maybe, partially, but it could be an alternative. It may suffer from something called reverse causality. 
the other way around, if you think about it, if I get depressed, um, am I more likely to smoke and get addicted to it? If it is true, it also could bring us this pattern. So, only this observation doesn't suggest that smoking is the reason for depression. The other way around is also possible. This is called reverse causality. Well, so it actually reminds us to think about all those alternative explanations when we try to imply some causation from correlation. Hey, this one is famous. Before the presidential election of 1936, a very popular magazine back then called Literary Digest conducted a survey among its subscribers. The sample size is huge. It's more than 2 million return postcards they received. So based on that very large sample, they very competently forecasted this man, the man on the right, Alf Lander, will be the next president. But do you know him? I don't know. Because everybody knows, in the end, Franklin Roosevelt become the president. And he won by a very big victory. What went wrong in this example? Two million. That's a very large sample. But the sample is selected. Not selected by the magazine, but selected by themselves. Think about it. They are subscribers of a magazine, so they are literate. It's 1936. The literacy ratio is not very high back then. So they are educated, and I guess they are likely to be middle class and above. So those two million observations are not representative of the whole voting population. This type of error is called sample selection bias or selective sample bias. Okay, and the last example is a true story which occurred during World War II. If we look at those claims hanging back from you know, operations, military operations, their body are covered in bullet holes. And you will find some areas are actually more damaged. You will find more bullet holes on the wings, for example. And it's natural to think, if we want to armor this military aircraft, where should you armor them? You probably think that we should armor those areas with more bullet holes. But then a statistician called Abraham Ward said something very different. He said, remember, those are the planes who returned safely from operations. It means that they withstand damage in those areas without compromising the safe return. So what really counts are actually those areas with no bullet holes are. That means if you are shot in those areas, you cannot manage to come back. So that's called the missing bullet holes. Instead of armoring those areas with more holes, you should armor those areas with no holes. That's quite counterintuitive. That's how a careful examination of causation can give us very insightful but counterintuitive conclusions sometimes. Okay, I think now we all know that correlation does not imply causation. They can be just purely by chance, like in the Nicholas Cage example. Or they can suffer from all sorts of bias. Sometimes it's because of some omitted variable we didn't consider that caused the occurrence of A and B. Sometimes we have to think it's the opposite, it's the, the, you know, the reverse way also possible. 
Is it a reverse causality, like in the smoking and depression example? Sometimes we have to make sure the sample is random, not selected. If it is a selected sample, it can cause bias, like what the magazine, you know, the mistake the magazine made. Or we have to think about, in many cases, what we observe are the survivors. So we have to be careful about the survival bias, like in the missing bullet hole example. Okay. So the investigation of causality um, extends beyond the scope of scientific research. It is also important in social sciences, like in economics, in analyzing public policies. And when I think about it, I think it is also important to really take those true and useful health advice from other people, because many of them are just correlations, if you think about it. Like you often hear among those who have, you know, uh, who live long, they like eating apples, so maybe eating apples is good for your health. That's just purely correlation. It doesn't say much about causality. Right? They, they probably just live in those areas with good apples, and those areas that actually contribute to their health, not because of the apples. Right? And if you think about it, if you want to learn things from other people's success stories, you now you have to be careful about, is it a selective sample bias? Because people who get successful, they, have, they often emphasize that because of their hard work, because of they made good choices, but they don't mention much about how lucky they were. But if you ask those people who consider themselves not successful, they often blame for bad luck, right? So, at least one of them is not telling the truth. It's a selective sample of bias. And I want to share with you, this mindset of causation also plays a part in our sources of motivation. How is that possible? I want to take myself as an example. I used to be a person who strived very hard for other people's recognition. I tried to do good, I tried to I studied very hard, I tried to be nice to every people, I try, you know, try to, to be good in every area, but that's not possible. Until one day, one close friend of mine told me, Jack, you do not have to be perfect to be loved. Then I started to realize that deep in my mindset, I had this causation saying that I have to be good to be recognized and to be loved. I'm not saying this is wrong. I'm saying there are alternatives. Well, when we start to recognize we are already in love and we have so many care from other people, we started a new source of motivation, which is the power of gratitude. We start to recognize and appreciate more for the people, the experiences that enrich our lives. And our mindset change, our causation change, switch from I have to be good, to be respected, recognized, and loved, to something else. I am loved and cared by my parents, by my friends. I'm served well in my community so that I want to be good, do well in my area, and to care for other people, to help other people, and to serve the society. Rather than being externally motivated, I can be now internally motivated. And this is positive psychology. It's not because of anxiety or competitiveness, it's because of gratitude. And in this way, it not only just benefits ourselves, your own well-being, it also starts a very positive rippling effect in your community, in your lives. 
So, that's remember. Correlation may capture our attention, but it's causality which holds the key to unlock knowledge and truths in our lives. Thank you for your attention.